So number 13 from the 2009 advanced tyre. Graph of a rational function. So what have we got here? Get the equation of the asymptotes. Show that it's strictly decreasing. So it's going to go stationary points. Find where it cuts the axis. We'll also find where it cuts the asymptote. Hmm, well, fair enough. And then sketch it. First part then, obtain the equations for the asymptotes for three marks. Now there's no mention of how it approaches them, so that won't be necessary. Unless it specifically asks for how does it approach the asymptotes, you don't need to go through that routine. It is quite a lengthy routine. Quite often the configuration of the points, of where it cuts the axis and where the turning points are, and so on, is enough to establish the nature of the shape of the graph. Now first thing, asymptotes are straight away. That little disclaimer for the validity of this function immediately says x can't be plus or minus 1 because then you'd be dividing by 0 and you'd be shooting off to infinity. So there's an asymptote straight away, but you better state it first. So what have we got? So vertical asymptotes. We'll just put vertical asymptotes. You'll get vertical asymptotes when the denominator x squared minus 1 is equal to 0. Now you can solve that either way. There's only one mention of x. You could take the one across and take the square root, or you could factorise it, whichever you like. But we'll just take that across. x squared equals 1, so x equals plus or minus 1. I better state them separately. Look, bing. So the best class from two is x equals negative 1 and x equals 1. Now the non vertical asymptotes. The non vertical asymptotes would require you to find out what happens to this expression as you go off to infinity. Does it level off to a certain value? And it will. If the degrees of the numerator and denominator, these powers here, if these powers are the same, or if the bottom power is higher, then it's going to go to a horizontal asymptote, either at some value, or in the case of a proper fraction, with the denominators of a higher degree, but the bottom's bigger, then it would just go to zero. Now, there's two ways of doing that. <coughs> First of all, we'll say this. It's the graph it's talking about, so I should say y equals... So I'll put this, I've got y equals x squared plus 2x over x squared minus 1. Now, if I'm not interested in establishing how it approaches these asymptotes, simply what is the value of this limit as x tends to infinity, then I can simply use that device that you use with any rational expression to discover its limit to infinity, which is to divide by the highest power of the variable. So dividing everything by x squared would give you 1, Plus, dividing this by x squared would make it 2 over x. Dividing that by x squared makes it 1. And dividing by x squared makes it 1 over x squared. The reason for that is, you're not sure how these behave when the numbers are very big. But you're quite certain how this fraction behaves. If the denominator of a fraction is very big, then the fraction itself is very small. If x goes to infinity, those fractions go to 0. So you can quite definitely say, as x tends to infinity... That means that y would tend to, I should have said, 1, and that'll just go to 0. And that'll just go to 0, which means you've got y equals just 1. So y equals 1 would be your non-vertical asymptote. There it is. That's the first three marks. Now, one other thing, though. If you wished to divide that in, because that's the process you use with the slanting non-vertical asymptotes, then you could go ahead and do that with this as well. Usually the advantage of that other one is, not only do you get the slanting asymptotes by dividing it in to get the two portions, but it also makes the differentiation easier. So instead of having to use the quotient rule, you've got a very simple form. But there's not much to choose between them in this case. If you did want to divide that into that, you wouldn't actually need to do the division. Because in the case where the degrees are the same top and bottom, you can do that simply by partitioning it into two parts rather than carrying out this division, which would look like this, x squared plus 2x and then plus 0. Instead of doing that division, you could just partition that in the same way as you would do this. If I had x plus 2 over x plus 1, then I could split that into two parts, like that simply by separating the x plus 2 to make it match the denominator. So I just need one part of the 2, and that leaves the other part of the 2 there. And then, of course, that part just becomes 1 plus, and that saves you having to do the division. And you can do the same with that. So if you did want to divide it out, you could do that. You could simply split it. I've got x squared minus 1. I've got x squared minus 1. I want the top to be x squared minus 1. Right, so what do I still have? So I've used up the x squared, 
I've not used the 2x, so that's over there. There wasn't a 1, there wasn't any number there, so it's like splitting 0 would split into negative 1 and positive 1. So that would then be equal to 1 plus 2x plus 1 over x squared minus 1. That would give you the division. But if you followed that route, you would still have to do this thing here in order to establish what happens to this part as x tends to infinity. Because you can't just look at that and think, oh, what might happen? The only thing you know for certain is if you've got the variable in the denominator and that goes to, that becomes very large, then the fraction disappears. So I still have to go through the same process. Down just to show you. Dividing them by x squared, I'd have 2 over x, 1 over x squared, 1, and then minus 1 over x squared, which is involving more work. And then, letting x go to infinity, we turn that into 0, plus 0 over 1 minus 0, 0 over 1, which is 0. So then it would just tend to y equals 1 as before. There's no point doing that. Even as far as the next as the following part for the differentiation, there's not much difference between differentiating that and differentiating that. So in this case, I probably would just have stuck with this part. Next part, show that f of x is a strictly decreasing function. Right, so I'm not going to use the while, I'll stick with that f, because it says it's talking about functions. So that means I want to find f dash dx. Strictly decreasing means that this derivative should always be negative, not even zero. Strictly decreasing means it should always be negative. Somehow I've got to get the derivative and show it's always negative. Well, that'll be the quotient rule then. So it'll be square the denominator, and then it's just the same pattern. Well, it came from the product rule anyway. So it'll be differentiate at the top, 2x plus 2, multiply it by the denominator, minus, leave the top alone, x squared plus 2x, multiply it by the derivative of that denominator, I forgot the v squared there, which is just 2x. Now let's just tidy that lot up. So x squared minus 1, all squared. What have we got? Four different types of terms. So we're going to have 2x cubed, pick out the next ones, plus 2x squared, minus 2x, minus 2, just the two terms here, minus 2x cubed, very handy, minus 4x squared. So what's that all together without having to take up too much space? The x cubed go, and then I've got minus 2, it's full of minus 2s. I've got minus 2 of the x squareds, I've got minus 2 of the x's, and I've got minus 2 for the number. So it actually becomes this, now you to show that that's always negative. Well, certainly that part's always negative, being fixed, a constant. This part is always positive, since it can't be zero. I've already got that exclusion. So I need to show that this part is always positive. And then I'll have a negative times a positive divided by a positive, which is always negative. Which means, if I want to show that this is always positive, I have to have a squaring in it. So I'm going to complete the square. So that's just another partitioning in effect, isn't it? So we just think, well, ignoring that one at the end x squared plus x would have come from a square bracket including x to make the x squared and a half so that the prod twice the product gives me the x. Now that would make x squared, got it, twice the product, x got it, plus a quarter. Well I've got one altogether, I've used up a quarter of it so there's still three quarters left if you wish to do it that way. Then I can say for certain that means that f dash dx is always less than zero since those parts are positive. Do I need to make a statement well, maybe I'll we'll make a right statement. Since x squared minus 1 squared is always greater than 0, again, I'd have to make a statement to justify that. x not equal to plus or minus 1. And, obviously, and this doesn't require any qualification, because even if that could be 0, as soon as you add on 3 quarters, that's definitely greater than 0. Which means f of x is strictly decreasing. Then, Find the coordinates of the points where the graph crosses effectively the axis, but also for some reason the horizontal asymptote. That might be useful in determining exactly how it approaches the asymptotes, for instance. Well, x-axis, that's trivial. If you're on the x-axis, that means that your y-coordinate must be zero. And if your y-coordinate is zero, we're talking about the graphs now, so it's y equals, not f of x equals. That means that this thing equals zero. And if a fraction 
is equal to zero, it's sufficient for its numerator to equal zero. So I just have to factorise that and solve it, take out the common factor of x. And that gives me x equals zero, or x equals negative two, so there's my points. Zero, zero, negative two, zero. And of course that's why it didn't ask where does it cut the y-axis, because I've already got a point in the y-axis here, the origin, and since it's a function, there can only be one point where it crosses the y-axis. Now the next bit, where does it cut this horizontal asymptote? Well, just the same as that. If y equals 1, that means that only this time I'll have to use the complete expression. That should equal 1. Well, multiply both sides by x squared minus 1, which is fair enough because that can never be 0. So I've got equals x squared minus 1. Well, look, they just knock themselves out. 2x equals negative 1, which means x equals negative a half. So that point's going to be negative a half, one. For whatever reason that was required, maybe the graph will make that clear. And that is the next part. So the last part, sketch this graph showing clearly all the relevant features. But of course the relevant features just means, where does it cut the axis? Where are the stationary points? Where are the asymptotes? How does it approach them? Again, it didn't ask how it approached them because that's probably just determined by the configuration of the information you've got already. So putting in the relevant parts, what have we got? These are the asymptotes. So there's asymptotes at x equals negative 1, an asymptote at x equals 1, a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1, intersection with the axis, there they are, intersection with the axis and so on. It crosses here, it crosses at negative two, and it crosses the horizontal asymptote at negative a half one. I'll put that in, negative a half one. And then it's just a case of fitting it all the way through. And I didn't really need to determine how it approached them in this particular case, because you knew it was strictly decreasing. That means it's always got to be going down the way. So the first part would be this, if it's always going down the way and it's to pass through that point and it's to approach this and approach that, the only way it can do that is by coming this way. That would be decreasing. There was no option for that if I had to pass through that point. It couldn't have come from above because I know there wasn't any other intersections, and there you go, with the line y equals 1. Next one, how can it be an asymptote to this line and this line and pass through that point and always be going down? Well, it must just be coming down like this. So it must come down through those two points and carry on to the bottom. Notice there is a little twist there. There will be a point of inflection because the curvature is changing. But that point of inflection didn't affect the fact that it was strictly decreasing because it wasn't a horizontal point of inflection. It isn't one you would find from the first derivative. The second derivative would give you this point of inflection, but it's not really a significant feature as far as sketching is concerned. Then the last part, after being asymptote to this line, an asymptote to that line, and strictly decreasing, must be going down the way. Well, the only way I can do that is this. So that would be the graph of it all then. There's the graph of y equals, I'll just say f of x. That's question 13.